I can't tell if you're half asleep or <laughs> the piano's really loud, so I can't hear if you're singing, so I'm kind of just teasing you. Well, I woke up this morning wondering if Martin Luther King woke up morning shaking his head at the world and wondering if his efforts mattered. I've wondered this for a long time. My musing was about whether it matters that we resurrect the icon of history year after year. And then in my regular poetry reading contemplation on Sunday mornings, I read this from the poet Lee Young Lee. Is any looking back a waste of time? The whole of it too finely woven a net of innumerable conditions, causes, effects, counter effects, impossible to read like rain on the surface of a pond. Is any looking back a waste of time? The spirit does move when you open a book at random and that word is there. And I thought that our remembrance of King is not only mandatory by the calendar, but slim a slim acknowledgement of his great contributions and less his faults, looking seductively to his speeches and less his actions. Yet our remembrance is made more robust this year by anniversaries of Selma and new films depicting him. But I wondered this week, how is King's dream doing today? The condition of our world seems fragile in the reflection of King's dream. With unprecedented acts of racism from men of color being shot, some of them within seconds of engagement of law enforcement, to reactions to those shootings across the spectrum, some of which have been very unsettling, to protests, many of which were uplifting, although in my efforts to see how we might be involved in post-Ferguson responses. All I saw was disorganization and even dangerous activity I was not willing to be part of. And violence, race-related shootings and looting and everything in between. And abuses of power. Racial profiling is alive and well in America today. In 2012, police shootings rose steadily in our largest cities in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, even as crime on a whole declined. According to one report I read, a black man is killed by law enforcement every 28 hours here in America. And the worst of what I saw was the veiled racism in circles of power that began to seep out through the edges of our democracy recently. I don't know if you caught the news on the last day of 2014, but David Dukes, for, the former Grand Wizard of the Klan, current neo-Nazi denier of the Holocaust and almost governor of Louisiana, rose from the ashes to warn those putting pressure on Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise, the third highest ranking Republican leader who came under fire for having spoken to a white supremacist group, David Duke said he would out members of our Congress and Senate on both sides of the aisle as white supremacists if they put pressure on Scalise. With all this, I'm asking, what is happening? Is this progress or regression? And how to remember MLK in the midst of all of this? Is his dream dead or on life support or coming alive again? Are we getting closer to the dream or getting real with each other? For me, the sadness in the midst of all this is also about gun violence. We saw shootings just yesterday in Florida. It's about division and divisiveness. Last year's events in Missouri made me remember the words of Dr. King who said, I have walked 
among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men. I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes mostly meaningfully through nonviolent actions. These are the words of King, not directly to those in Ferguson, obviously, but for those, he said, in the ghettos of the North during the urban unrest of the 1960s. What you hear in his statement there is something important, I think. He offered his deepest compassion to these young African-American men in the 1960s. Something my colleague, Reverend White, pointed out last week has been severely lacking in all our prognostication about Ferguson. And the compassion we might give is not just to angry young men in the streets, in the so-called ghettos who are mostly made into scapegoats by us for our own comfort, but for us all who suffer under the strain of misunderstanding each other and the failure to see past skin and family of origin and whatever other boundaries we can create. The two things King points to that we cannot miss over and over again are nonviolence and compassion. And I was wondering this week, watching the events following the shootings and the terrorism in Paris, what is happening in the world to nonviolence and compassion? Is this world more enlightened and more at peace? I don't see it. I see violence increasing and our divisions increasing. I see opportunities to heal given up for backhanded satirical slaps like what I believe Charlie Hebdo did with their weeping Mohammed on the cover of their magazine precisely at the moment when they could have asked for unity they chose to alienate Muslims and turn radicals attention their way we can debate the cover of their magazine all day, but I believe they let their anger get in the way and they played into the hands of the, the terrorists. I read one article that says the terrorist strategy in places like Paris follow a Stalinistic strategy of old. Al-Qaeda wants to mentally colonize French Muslims and radicalize their lack of interest in their religion by making it possible for the French to act out against their Muslim neighbors. They know that the feeling of insecurity and alienation can turn a moderate Muslim toward the radical one. Stalin used this early on as a leader of the Bolsheviks who harassed the public to gain sympathy for those who might join them. This backward, upside-down strategy can work, but only if the French let themselves be seduced by the idea of an enemy in their midst. Only if they allow magazine covers to stoke the flames and then let the far right, the National Front leaders, speak on this topic. We have the same problem here in America. When we let arch-conservatives speak for all Americans, on political topics or religious topics as if they speak for all people and all people of faith. That is why I think King is so important because he occupied the middle. He spoke with integrity from his religious point of view, rarely speaking for others, always speaking for himself. And his message was consistent, always seeking unity. He spoke from what I consider something hardwired in us all, but short-circuited by the rambunctious, loud voices of the few. That hard wire is that we will all survive if we cohere, that we are not 
separate, that we understand ourselves as unified, that out of many comes one. The hard wire of that type of sentiment was present the days after the shooting in Paris as Parisians marched the streets chanting, Nous sommes Charlie, or Je suis Charlie, we are Charlie, or we are, I am Charlie, or Je suis Ahmed, even more important for the Muslim police person who was shot. They spoke from the hard wire, understanding themselves as unified. You see, the more we allow ourselves to be divided, the more the terrorists or the racists win. The more we fail to see our coherence and our unity, the more we lose. That is why following Ferguson, the movement of Black Lives Matter was so important, especially for white people in this country. Seeing the white clergy kneel in prayer on the Ferguson City Hall steps with black clergy put a good feeling in my heart that we can stand together. We can speak of this coherence. Seeing Black Lives Matter means that we understand something deep. We understand that from a white privileged perch, we cannot think that Black Lives Matter means white lives don't matter, but rather we all matter. This is the point of Martin Luther King's life that we all matter. The core message. When he marched in Selma and on, in Montgomery and in Washington, D.C. and through the halls of the White House and the churches of the South and indeed the UU General Assembly, he said the same thing. He said, we all matter and until we truly embrace this, we will be divided. And know only the growing divide that keeps us from love and compassion and indeed peace. So you're sitting there thinking, okay, I get that, but what do I do about it? How does a person sitting in a pew in a church in University Park do anything about this? And to be honest, the answers we have given you have been slim also. Get to know people different than yourselves, we have said. Work in coalition. Confront injustice. A little abstract, although we do deal in abstraction. A few more robust answers might be to ground yourself in spiritual practice or even more to understand or even ask yourself what God is calling you to be. Not what God is calling you to do, but what is God calling you to be in this world. And then also to ask yourself where your bias is. I don't care if you're white, black, brown, gay, straight, or otherwise, we all have bias. There are tests by the Harvard researchers to help you examine this. I did one this week and it was enlightening. Every time a news story about a young person of color or a white policeman or some racial incident happens, we need to ask ourselves how we see the circumstances, how we make up our minds about each other, how we change how we encounter our own bias. This is spiritual work and much needed. I was in Florida after vacation, as I told you, after Christmas, and we drove there and we stopped at a lot of gas stations. And I couldn't help noticing in myself an unease in those gas stations, remembering Michael Dunn, who shot Jordan Davis for the loud music in his car. I knew that my nice white family was safe from such things. But I worried about us, about the guns in the cars around us, about the 
possibilities of violence, but more so about my own bias. Not bias toward the young black man in the car with the loud music, but the middle-aged white man with the gun. And I knew in that same moment that I could count on the privilege I had to go anywhere I wanted and to do anything I wanted without suspicion or facing the kinds of bias we all know about. So has King's dream faded? That's the question in our complicated world today. He wanted to end racism and he wanted to end poverty. But we see racism bubbling up despite gains in freedom and rights for people of color and a change in society in general. It's still not so much in the hearts and minds of many people around us. And the income gap in our country increases every day and I fear the more we deregulate markets, lower taxes and then cut spending for those already neglected and economically abandoned, the more we will create divisions we cannot heal. Northern and southern ghettos we do not understand and failures in peacemaking and compassion abound. And the less we talk about racism, ours and our nations, and the less we challenge claims about how politics will solve our income cap, the more we will turn it over to those who stand on the far edges of religious and political spectrums, whose goal is only to divide us. King's dream it seems a little broken. It seems a little dusty. But here's the hope. I take hope in today's remembrance of our sitting together, thinking about Martin Luther King. Because I believe that however faded the dream gets, despite how dusty the speeches and the readings and the remembrances of King get, the dream can never die. It is my theology to say to you that as a Unitarian, I believe the solutions to all these problems come not from the supernatural, but from the naturally super abilities within each of us. To overcome our selfish desires, to see here in our communities, brothers and sisters all, Unity out of diversity, e pluribus unum. I believe it is our religious imperative to celebrate the millions who march in peaceful ways, to address the wrongs of perception perpetuated on the poor and perpetuated on communities of color. I believe it is our faith to point to moments like today when in the face of violence and terrorism and all forms of despair, in all forms of despair, we see our compatriots, our brothers and sisters march in the street shouting, not kill the Muslim, kill the terrorist, but nous sommes Charlie, je suis Charlie. We are Charlie, we are Trayvon, we are Michael Brown, we are all in this together. And that emboldens the heart. I believe that to see you, members of this church and community, engaged in asking, how do we address bias of all kinds for equity, inclusion, and Dignity for all is the best medicine for the sick soul who wakes up and wonders, is King's dream dead? In doing these things, in the name of our faith, in the name of personal integrity, or just doing what is right, is to hold up King's dream and to feel the importance of 
not turning away from the difficult things in our world or in our lives, a sacred act in and of itself. We together bear witness to the things so hard to see or look at in our lives and our world. And in that confrontation, we see King with us, urging us forward from his stance of courage, saying, this is what will save us. This must save us. King wakes up every day, shakes his head at the world and wonders with us if any of this matters. But his answer is not despair. His answer is yes. Yes, it does for the good of us all. So brothers and sisters, by God's will and by our memory and our commitment today and tomorrow, I say that King lives. But King only lives if we do one thing. If we live for one another. And to that I say, Amen.